version of Shakespeare. So, first of all, so who do we have here? We've got Alex and Alan. Hi, I haven't met you before, I don't think, Alan. How are you tonight? Uh, I'm good, thank you. Excellent, good. Um, and how are you, Alex? We've met. <laughs> how are you this evening, Alex? I'm all right, yeah, how are you? Oh, I'm good, thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, okay, so we're going to look at Shakespeare. So which plays are you both doing of Shakespeare? What are you doing, Alex? Uh, for Shakespeare? Mm -hmm. uh, Romeo and Juliet. Okay. What about you, Alan? Uh, I'm doing Macbeth. Macbeth. Okay, so what we will do is we will look at Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet, but mostly what we will be doing is looking at how to answer Shakespeare questions and what is important in terms of how to answer the questions. And But before we start, <clears throat> so we're going to look at Shakespeare and what we're looking at is what does the question look like? They do slightly differ, EDUCAS and AQA. So I have got here, so who who is it who's doing AQA? Is it... I'm doing AQA. Okay, and you're doing EDUCAS, Alan? Yeah. Okay, so we'll look at both types of questions, okay? And um, we'll look at how many marks they're worth, and we'll look at how long you should take on each question, and what do you need to include, okay? So, <clears throat> can you answer any of these questions already? What does the question, what do the questions look like? Can you answer any of that, Alex or Alan? What do the Shakespeare questions look like? All these like big, like writing questions about something, about like how Shakespeare makes something, makes something else or something like that. Yeah, or, and what are you given, what are you given to look at? Um, part of an extract that you have to use for your answer. Yes, excellent. Okay, and is it the same for Educast? Uh, yeah. It, it would just say how how does Shakespeare portray uh, like the relationship of Macbeth or the theme of kingship? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't know what to do with this. Um, should I apply? I don't know. I don't know if I should have declined that. Sorry, everyone. Okay. Does anybody know how many marks with this does slightly differ between EDUCAS and AQA? How many marks for AQA, Alex? Um, I'm, I can't exactly. It's... It's like I had 20, I think it's 20, oh, no, not 20, it won't be, is it 30? We'll have 40. a look later. Don't worry, don't worry. What about you, Alan? Do you know how many marks your questions were? Uh, I'm not so sure either. Okay, well, that's why we're here, okay? You do need to know all these things. Why do you think it's important to know exactly what's expected of you on the question? So you're prepared, you're most prepared when you're answering it. Yeah. And because if you know exactly what's on that question, what happens to your brain is instead of going into panic when you read the, when you look at into that exam, your brain and your whole body goes, oh, I know this already. So you can just snap right into it. OK, so instead of panicking, because it is a bit of a panicky paper, because the thing is, there are lots of other questions as well. So you're panicking, trying to get to your question. Where's Macbeth? Where's Romeo and Juliet? Oh, okay. And then you find it and then you're thinking, oh, how many marks with? Oh, what do I need to do? Okay. So what we'll do is we'll go through the questions. We'll go through a little, so we'll spend half the time-ish looking at Romeo and Juliet, half the time-ish looking at Macbeth. Is that okay with both of you? But mostly you, you write, you, 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 answer the questions in the same way the, the formula that you need to use is the same so that's the most important thing anyone knows how long we should take on these questions or what is the trick to know how long you're supposed to take isn't it like it's one mark a minute but it's like yeah it takes a mark to run up to 40 minutes well said alex that's exactly right yeah so a mark a minute so if it's a 25 mark question 
you're spending about 25 minutes on it. If it's a 15 mark question, you're spending about 15 mark minutes on it. What do you need to include in the question, in the answer? Uh, quotes, annotations, references from the extract and the whole, the play as a whole. Uh, yeah, what are you having to identify always? Uh, and, yeah, annotations, like methods and stuff. So identifying the language and the dramatical techniques. You have to remember and always keep in mind, your teachers have probably said this, this is a play, this is a drama. So you're not talking about how it's read, you constantly have in your mind that it is a play and it's what you're watching and it's always the, the audience's reaction. Okay? Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. So yeah. we'll have a little look at Macbeth, but please bear in mind, Alex, okay, that it's the same ideas for Romeo and Juliet, okay? They are both... Um, with, you, you're all the time needing to look at um, ideas, themes, um, you know, who, who's saying what and um, how the audience is going to react to that, not the reader, how the audience is reacting to it, okay? So keep that in mind. So first of all, now pretend they said Romeo and Juliet, so we'll think Macbeth or Romeo and Juliet, what are they about? So what are the plays about? You can put it in chat if you're right. Let's let's open a chat out to each other. So in chat, tell me, what are these plays about? What kind of questions may you be given? And then we're going to have a look at the question. So what... Uh, I'm going to show them right now. Um, so I can't type in chat, but I can type in chat in like, in like 10 minutes. Okay. Five minutes. So can you tell me what the play is about? I'm just going to move over here. What is um... the... I can't, it's, I can't remember the exact character names. It's like uh, Macbeth and his friend. I can't... No, no, what about Romeo and Juliet? You're studying... Oh, oh Romeo and Juliet. Um, it's basically at the um, beginning of the play, uh, the monster and capitalist servants have a fight in the streets and then um, the prince comes along and says, anyone who fights in the streets um, dies, punished by death. So what is uh, that called the what at the beginning? Because that's very important for Romeo and Juliet. What um, is it called at the beginning? Uh, uh, it's um oh, I, I know what it is as well. It's um not a sonnet. Uh so we have two that it's called a prologue. Remember? Uh, okay. Yeah. So let's think about that because Romeo and Juliet has a prologue, so that's part of the dramatic structure which creates something called dramatic irony. Okay. So we have the prologue, and what does the what happens in the prologue? Um, it basically just tells you what's going to happen in yes. the play. Isn't that strange? So we're getting told at the very beginning, right? This is a play, and this is what happens: two people fall in love with each other, two families fighting each other. They're going to kill each other. They're going to die. It's dead sad. Yeah. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it because like? Shakespeare copied the idea of someone or something, like off an Italian writer, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that happened a lot, okay, because they all shared ideas. So, but the important thing is, so why why did he do that? And let you think about the witches, Alan. That's the opening, that's the beginning of the play, isn't it, Macbeth? So we have these two dramatic techniques right at the opening of these plays. So we have the prologue, we're told exactly what's going to happen exactly the tragedy that that befalls us why would we do that so that the audience is sat there going oh that's what's gonna happen but do, what do they spend the whole of the play doing hoping against the odds that that does not happen and that's where the next um <clears throat> dramatic technique comes in cathartic we heard of this cathartic technique. Anybody heard of that? Have you heard of that, Alan? Um, no, I haven't. It's from Aristotle. Have we heard of him? Yeah. Well, who was he? Was he a Greek philosopher, was it? He was, oh. and he invented the idea of the tragedy, okay? Now... Romeo and Juliet is not necessarily the tragedy because there is hope at the end, okay? But is Macbeth a tragedy, Alan? 
Uh, yeah. This is. How do we know it's a tragedy? What do we need in order for the tragedy to exist? Uh, one of the main characters to die, which would yeah. be Macbeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so that is true. We do need, we're not, we need a main character, don't we? Yeah. So we have to have that main character. What do we call the main character? Would it be a protagonist? Yeah, that's exactly right. We have the protagonist. And what does the protagonist have to have? Antagonist. Pardon? Is it an antagonist? They need an aim, first of all. Okay? The protagonist has to have an aim. They have to have a want, something they want. Okay? The protagonist has to have something that they want. And then they also need to have something else. They do. They, they, something has to get in, in the way of that want. There has to be some conflict, doesn't there? But what does the protagonist have to have? A, and it comes from the Greek, it comes from Aristotle. A, fate. No, nobody know. A fatal flaw. Yeah. Have you heard of that, Alan? Yeah. Yeah. So what is Macbeth's fatal flaw? Um, I'm not so sure. Well, he is ambitious. Okay. So whereas in Romeo and Juliet, we spend the play going, no, please, she's not dead. Just love each other. Just get on. In Macbeth, we spend the play saying, why haven't you just got enough? Leave it now. That cannot go right. Stop. But he can't help it because he has a fatal flaw. And the tragedy is his own fatal flaw kills him. Okay? It's himself. It's his ambition, his thirst for power, his ruthlessness in the end. That's what destroys him. Okay? There are all other kinds of themes and ideas going on that go along with that as well that we have to have at the same time have you heard of the divine rights of kings yeah what does that mean so it'd go god first kings would it be thanes peasants and then slaves yeah and why is that important in this play because macbeth is a thane and he takes it takes the place of the king, but not rightfully. Exactly. So there's a lot of imagery, isn't there, about clothes and the clothes not fitting properly because Shakespeare, and this is important for both of you, was employed by the king. His actors were called the king's men. What king was on the throne? King James. Yes. And why was King James a little bit paranoid and a little bit worried? After, would it be, what's his name? <laughs> um, Guy Fox. after he tried to assassinate King James. Excellent, yeah. And who was um, King James's mother? Mary, Queen of Scots. So she was assassinated by Queen Elizabeth. Okay, and James always had this feeling that maybe he shouldn't have even been on the throne. Okay, other people, well, he thought that other people thought he maybe shouldn't be on the throne. So he's always trying to say, I am the right king. I should be here. Okay. Um, so family is also involved in both of these plays throughout the plot. Family, who do we belong to? Where is our loyalty? Yeah, what should we do? Where is our role? Where is our place in society? That once again comes straight from the Greeks. And what the Greeks were saying, theatre was not like it is today. Theatre was almost like, um, it was the media. It was how they penetrated society. It was how they told people things. You know, stay there, stay in your place. That's what this was doing as well. So it was a vehicle to say to people, be scared, do not go against the king. And what about the idea of witches? Where did that come from? Alan. 
Would it be that King James was quite paranoid, uh, paranoid of them? He la- he, yeah, he was fascinated by witches. He believed in witches. <laughs> okay, so when we think about this play, we have to understand that the witches were not a figment of Macbeth's imagination. They are real. We take that they are real. So if we think of both of the openings of these plays, we have the prologue telling us what's going to happen. And then what are the witches doing? Alan? Uh... They start talking about Macbeth, which is bad because it links Macbeth to the witches. Yeah, and what is the purpose, do you think, of those witches? What happens? Why are they there? To foreshadow, like, something bad would happen to Macbeth. Yeah, to tell us, really. And they are a vehicle, they're a dramatic technique, they're a dramatic vehicle used to set tone, to set atmosphere, to set genre, to to make sure that we know it's sinister, as well as the pathetic fallacy that is used. What do I mean by pathetic fallacy? Uh, when I'm mirroring, like, the mood of a character. No, 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 it's like, um, no. The cat, no, the weather being affected. No, it's when you with the weather and the character. Where's the weather? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, pathetic fallacy. Have you heard of this, Alan? Yeah. What is it then? What do you think it means? So, it links the weather to the character. So, if someone's feeling sad, it, it might be like raining outside. Yeah, and tone and atmosphere. So it sets the tone, doesn't it, the atmosphere? So does that happen in Macbeth? Yeah, because when the witches come on, it's like a foggy, eerie background while they're talking. Exactly. So what does that tell the audience? That the witches, like, are bad, basically. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and so something bad's gonna happen exactly and when we're thinking about the staging of these um plays so if we think about if you go to have either of you seen romeo and juliet or macbeth on the stage no no it's on next week you know in the every Ma- in the playhouse macbeth it's a bit of a different sort of take on it but it's on next week if you did. It's worth going to see on the stage because it's important. That's how it's supposed to be. And when you're writing, sometimes you can forget to say, you talk about the audience, okay? And it's really important. So when it was, the reason that Shakespeare's language is so colourful, is so full of imagery, is thick, okay? It's because why? Why is Shakespeare's language so full, so thick? You know, people write PhDs about one line in in, um, in Macbeth. They can talk about one section of Macbeth for three years nonstop. Why? Why is it so rich? Why was that important? Why are the words so important? Why is the dialogue so important? Uh, is it because Shakespeare wrote his plays to flatter the king? So they like him. Yeah, and definitely. His... Yeah. 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 What else? You know, so he's talking about the weather when the witches come on. Um, so why is it important? Why is that language important? Why is. What would the set. What, you know, have you, I've been to the globe and it's pretty much as it was, but. Now they might have a, or, you know, something going on. But there was nothing, was there then? They had no, they had none of these elaborate effects that we had today. So it all had to be fueled by the words. The audience's imagination had to be fueled by these words, okay? So that's why there are so many techniques within the language, so much imagery. Um. And that's why we have these different dramatic techniques. So, yes, Alex. I love it when people put their hands up. Yes. Didn't the, didn't the globe burn down? It's, it, it, there's, there's, it's, 
a replica exactly the same uh, as okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I went to see Ham. I've been a few times, but I saw Hamlet there last year and it was amazing. Amazing. You should go if you like Shakespeare. Or if not, go. It's really an experience. And you can get tickets for five pounds and stand up. So when it's exactly where it was and it's all exactly as it would have been in Shakespeare's day. So it's dead interesting and you know, the inn next door is as it was then, you know, so it's really good. Um, okay, so <clears throat> talking about imagery, just very, very quickly, can you list for me some of the imagery that you know exists in either of your plays? So let's see. I'll give you one for Romeo and Juliet, love. I'll give you one for Macbeth, clothes, dressing, okay? What else have we got? I love to watch them. What imagery is used in Romeo and Juliet? You may call them themes, but the, it's imagery. So we have love imagery, don't we? What other imagery is there? Death. Yeah. What else? Fate. What about Pardon? Fate. Fate. That's not imagery. So the words that are used to 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 convey theme, to convey meaning. Can you think of any of yours, Alan? Would guilt be one? Guilt is a theme. Have you answered a question on guilt? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Guilt is a theme. So how would that have been portrayed? Clothes are, are all about guilt, aren't they? He does not feel that he fits those clothes and he'll constantly talk about that because he's feeling guilty. What else is used to portray that guilt? To convey that feeling of guilt throughout. What other imagery? If we think of out and spot. Uh, does he use the imagery of water? Water, yeah. And what else goes? What else? Blood. Blood. Yeah. Because there's that constant repetition of that theme, isn't there? Of there's blood on my hands. I can't get rid of it. The sea, she sees blood. The blood doesn't stop. He's in a river of blood throughout because the thinking of the blood, it's constantly on the mind and it's reflecting that theme of guilt. So if you were answering a question about guilt, you would have to talk about blood. You would have to talk about clothing imagery. You'd have to find that to reflect the theme of guilt. Okay? Yeah. And in yours, Alex, there would be love. There's a lot of religious imagery, yeah, to reflect those themes of tragedy and innocence. Okay? So, have any of you seen this kind of acronym to answer a question? Let's think about answering questions now. P-E-E-L. Yes. Okay, so what does it stand for, Alex? You might use a different one, Alan. That's fine. If you do, just let me know which one you use. What does this... Um, point evidence technique explain. No, no, no. no. Point evidence technique analysis link. I use petal, so... Yeah, okay, you do petal. Yeah, that's great. What about you, Alan? What do you do? Um, I can't quite remember which one I do. Okay, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so what the, all these acronyms are used for is so that you ensure that what you put in the question, that you make sure that you have everything in the question that the specification needs, the, that the examiner is looking for, okay? So you can do them in any order. It doesn't matter. You just need to make sure that they're in there, okay? So, for example, you need to think about, you need to use those words from the question. So give the examiner their own words back. All right. If they're talking about guilt, keep talking about guilt. Keep putting that in your point. Keep reminding yourself and the examiner that you are on point and you know what they're asking you to. Because what happens sometimes is, and I've noticed a lot lately, and you're probably doing it yourself, yourself at the moment, Alan. People are... One of my students came to me and said, I've memorised loads and loads of quotes, miss. I've memorised about 50 quotes <laughs> because they think it's a memory test. Okay. 
But what can happen is you'll memorise all these quotes and then the question isn't quite the question that you wanted because you've memorised loads of quotes about Lady Macbeth. You think, well, I don't want to answer this question. You end up trying to answer the question that you can use these quotes for. So you have to make sure that you are answering the question that they want you to answer. And that might sound silly, but that's exactly what is happening a lot. It's not a memory game. It's a game about looking at the question and giving your opinion, your ideas, okay? And the thing is, if you have a good idea and you believe in it, trust yourself. Trust yourself, okay? And as long as you can back it up with a quote, okay, and an analysis, and a specified opinion, that's good. That's what you need to do, okay? So <clears throat> you need to use words from the question and give them back to the examiner. Then you need to identify the language or the dramatic technique, okay? That's really important. And say whereabouts it is in the text, all right? So if you're looking at the text that they've given you, talk about where it is, track it. Is it at the beginning? Is it in the middle? At the end? That might sound silly, but it's very important because usually what you're doing is you're building an argument. And then they might say to you, right, so where is this? What's happening in the rest of the text? You need to say in the beginning, it's like this. In the middle, it's like that. And at the end, this is what happens. And using those connectives, like furthermore, also in contrast to, these are the difference between a five and an eight. Just these little nuances, keeping on point, keeping clear, keeping yourself intact, if you like, because you can go all off track with this kind of question. Then you have your quote. And then what does this make us think and how does it make us feel? And thinking about the gap. What do I mean by gap? Anyone? What's that acronym? That's one of my little acronyms that I like. What's it important to do here in this question? <clears throat> okay, GAP stands for genre, audience. Anyone know what the P could possibly stand for? Is it purpose? Yes! Purpose. Why is that important and whose purpose are we talking about? Hello. Hmm? What do you think, Alex? Oh, what's the question again, Sally? Whose purpose are we talking about? So we're talking about purpose. Right? We're looking at purpose. Whose purpose are we are we talking about? Is it my purpose? Is it the actor's purpose? Is your, it your it? It's Shakespeare's purpose, isn't it? What oh. is Shakespeare trying to do here? And is he doing it? Okay? That's what that's the difference between a five and an eight or a nine. That you can say, right, at this moment in the play. Romeo and Juliet are doing this. She's saying that. Okay? A rose by other, any other name would smell just as sweet. Why at that moment is Shakespeare using the, that nature imagery? Why is he using that? What is it saying? And why at that moment in the play? And what is its effect on the audience? What do you think? Why? Why is why is that being said at that moment in the play, Alex? A rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. Why? What Shakespeare's purpose, if any? Do you think he just said it to you? So that's a nice thing to say. Why use a rose? Why talk about names? Because the theme of the play, the idea of the play of Romeo and Juliet is that innocence. Shakespeare wanted to project that Romeo and Juliet are innocent because they're children. They were infected by 
the adults, even with the greatest of purpose, the friar and the nurse tried to help Romeo and Juliet, but they infected them because they are adults and adults are corrupt by their very nature. But nature is sweet. It's not corrupted. Okay, it's still beautiful. It's still smooth. And a rose, even if it was called a tulip, would still be the same. So what they're saying is it doesn't matter what Romeo's name is. It doesn't matter what Juliet's name is. They love each other. Okay. And it's brought in at that particular part of the play because it is saying they are still innocent. They are still sweet. This is how they think. This is how they feel. But it's also the thorns and the rose are shown us. But there are thorns there. There is danger. It's not the way it seems. A rose might look beautiful, but it has to protect itself. It has to know nature is... So it's doing all that, it's foreshadowing it, so everything has its meaning, okay? And then if we think about Macbeth, why is this happening to Macbeth at the beginning? Why does Macbeth have doubts? Why does he have these doubts? Why does this be, why is this put in? Why he comes back? Why doesn't he just stay as he is? What is Shakespeare's purpose there? What's he trying to do, okay? Why does he put Lady Macbeth in the, in the forefront? Why is she there? We're going to look at a speech in a minute. Why do we see this speech and her becoming a certain way and the words that she says? So you're thinking all the time of Shakespeare's purpose, purpose, purpose. It is a play. That is the genre. It is a tragedy. Therefore, what is the effect on the audience? And if we can put that in... It makes such a difference because in the mark scheme, that shows that you are perceptive, okay? It shows that you've got a complex idea and analysis of this and you are perceptive. That's the word, perceptive. You're seeing something there, okay? Then finally, we have to link to context, which is what we've been talking about earlier. Why does Shakespeare write the way he does? Yeah, because of the king, because of the time that they that they wrote in. You know, if we think about religion and the Spanish Inquisition and the wars of religion and the insecurity of the crown, the fear of rebellion, okay? This is what was the, the backdrop and the context. We can also think here about, hum, you know, the longevity of Shakespeare, that these themes... Are still relevant today you know if we look at how many families are fighting in Romeo and Juliet if we think about you know still things like marriages that parents want you to marry this one and not that one feuding families it still happens you know these themes still exist it could be today with Macbeth did anybody watch Breaking Bad Anybody seen Breaking Bad? I'm watching it right now. Well, it's Macbeth, really, <laughs> in a different... There are a few elements, there's no witches, and his wife isn't quite the Lady Macbeth. But he starts off, you know, going out there not to become the person that he does, but he somehow, somewhere along the way, he becomes obsessed with power. OK, and being the best and being the greatest. And it's his downfall. OK, so he, that is his fatal flaw. And that fatal flaw is ultimately his downfall. And there's one moment where he gives a speech and he is actually saying, um, I, well, I might as well carry on as go back, which is exactly the same as when Macbeth is talking about the river the blood river that you might as well go forward because there's just as much blood behind him. Okay, so I'm going to look now at a question, okay? Um, a Macbeth question at first, and then we will look at another question. If that, is that okay with everyone? But it's the same sort of theme, Alex. It's the same way that we answer the question. So I'll show you. Uh, AQA and an Educast question. Okay, so here we have, would anybody like to do a little bit of acting? <laughs> we got any actors here? Alex, are you an actor? 
No, do I have to do all the acting? <laughs> okay. Well, this is, these are what the two questions look like. Okay, so my idea is that you should always look at the question first. What do you think? What do your teachers say? Does your teacher say that you should look at the question first, Alex, or read the text first? Um, I say read the question, um, for like two minutes. Just like, uh, just like read it and see what see what it says, and then you can read it and then you can highlight parts you think you can, you can use in the answer. Brilliant. Yes, exactly. So this is what an HUA question looks like, and this is what an Educast question looks like. Do you, does this does that look familiar? So put both on. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so the Educast question, what they would do, Alan, is give you two questions, one worth 15 marks and one worth 25. So the 15 marker is you're looking at the text, the 25 is the text and the rest. It will always be related to the text, but not asking you I, specifically about the text. Whereas the AQA, is asking you about the text, then refer to the text and the rest of the um, the rest of the play. So they're both very similar, okay, and about the same themes as well. All right, yes, makes sense. Have you seen them before? So now, have you seen this part of the text before, Alan? Yeah. I think my literature might be AQA and my language might be at Excel because they're it's like different examples. Oh, okay. I was t I see. Yeah. Well, if maybe because we're doing a one to one, so find out for definite. Does that look more familiar? The one on the top. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That's great. Okay. Good. Great. Um. So. Um. <clears throat> Let's have a read. So Macbeth, do we know where do you know where this is in the play, Alan? Is it when Macbeth has just killed King Duncan and he's just come yes. back to a lady? Brilliant, great, yes, well done. Okay, so Macbeth, methought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep, the innocent sleep, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, so labours back, balm of her minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. Lady Macbeth. What do you mean, Macbeth? Still it cried, sleep no more to all the house. Glamour's hath murdered sleep, and therefore Corder shall sleep no more. Macbeth shall sleep no more. Who was it? That thus cried, why were they thain? You do unbend your noble strength to think so brain sickly of things. Get some water and wash your hands, this filthy witness from your hand. And did you bring these daggers from the place? They must lie there, go carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. I'll go no more, I am afraid to think what I have done. Look on it again, I dare not. Infirm of purpose, give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. Tis the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms withal, for it must seem their guilt. <gasps> She's terrible, isn't she, at this point? Was that good acting, did you think? <laughs> um, okay, so starting with this conversation, explore how Shakespeare presents a relationship between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. So Alex, I don't want you to feel left out here because you still answer the questions the way we're looking at the question now, okay? Yeah. So for Romeo and Juliet, your question will be exactly the same, it'll just be a different part of the text. So we're thinking now about the techniques and how we have to answer the question. So what is the first thing we need to do now? What do we need to do with this question? What do we have to think about? How their relationship is like portrayed in the extract. Yeah, so it's explore how, isn't it? So we're exploring. So when you're exploring, there's no end. 
we're exploring okay so that means you're looking okay and you find something you look at it and you think mm, okay you're not that you're not supposed to have a definitive so don't be scared be confident and when you look at the mark scheme when you look at what they're looking for these i mark for aqa and edge cast sometimes and do you know how many of these i have to mark but every now and again you'll get somebody who says something that's just so interesting and you're like oh <gasps> It's like, I can't even describe what it's like. It's just so amazing. So stop thinking, what do they want me to say? And be honest, what do you think? What do you think? Okay, what is going on here? And the same for you, Alex, with Romeo and Juliet. What do you think? All right. So it's an exploration. All right, you're looking. And when I call it, you find words and you mine those words. You go into that word. You delve into that word and you think, why did Shakespeare use this word? Why did he use it here? What's he doing that for? What's that making me think? And how is that making me feel? And you think of those abstract nouns, shock, horror. And you're watching it. You're watching this, okay? And think of that audience watching this, okay? So. We underline those words that are important. How's it presented? So the how, how can, how can a writer do anything? What's the only thing a writer can do? Use what? Words. Yeah. So what, the only thing that Shakespeare is doing is using language to do something. That's how he's creating this present. That's how he's presenting this relationship, isn't it? The words. Okay. So we're exploring the words. We're mining the words of the relationship, you're quite right there, of both of them, okay? And we're starting with this conversation. So how does Shakespeare present it? And how does he present it in the play as a whole? All right? So how do we do this now? What do we do? And it's the same for you with Romeo and Juliet. What would, what's the first thing we do now? What do we look for? Where do we go in the text? Do we go to the end? We need to find quotes, don't we? We must always be led by the quotes, yeah? So we're not looking for quotes talking about relationship. We're looking at the language that they talk to each other to tell us about their relationship, aren't we? So, Macbeth does murder sleep, the innocent sleep, sleep that knits. So what's, what kind of language is going on there? What language feature is happening? What is happening there? There's another one. Sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep, the innocent sleep, sleep. It keeps on repeating sleep. Yes, repetition. So in our point, I would say, at the very beginning of the extract, <clears throat> the audience, I've got to get that word in audience so the examiner knows you know it's a play. The audience is subjected. I like to use different things. I don't like to say the audience is shown. The audience use different words. And I think this is quite a violent extract. Okay. It's, a, it's violent. It's not subtle and subdued. It's, <gasps> he's frantic. And that is portrayed in the language, that repetition. You know, it's like if he's in shock. That's what you do when you repeat something you're like, it's just happened, it's just happened. You know, when kids fall over, it's like, oh, they're upset, they repeat. Okay. The audience is subjected to the distraught repetition of the word sleep. Yeah. Okay. And then you would do your quote. 
Do, 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 do. Use ellipses. I wouldn't do all of that. I'd do some ellipses and then a bit of it. Okay. Bit of the middle, bit of the end. Quote, quotation marks. So what you've done there is you've said you've said we're about you starting at the extract. I would always start at the beginning. They've given you this extract for a purpose. They know it starts at the beginning and something starts. It, it, it makes sense. Okay. And the audience is being subjected. This is being thrown at them. These, these words are being thrown at them and the purposeful sleep, sleep, sleep. Okay. Guilt, guilt, guilt. Sleep, sleep, sleep. You can't sleep if you feel bad. You can't sleep if you feel guilty. Now, what is this? What, what's this making us think? You're right. He's just murdered somebody. What's it making us think? About Macbeth at this moment. He's come to his wife. He's just murdered. Done as, you know, he's done what he wanted to do. He's done what he was told. He's done what he thinks is being prophesized. Is it, he thinks he's going to become king or something now? Or something that happened? But I can't remember the plot after that no, one. No, 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 that's really good, Alex. Well done for joining in. That's great. Mm, I'm, 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 I did a Macbeth in like a lot of year nine, so. Yeah, no, it's good. You've done really well. Um, and it's the same kind of things that you would think of for Romeo and Juliet mm. anyway, so well done. Um, so do you think, what, what would the audience feel like now seeing him come in like this to his wife? What would what what are, what are the audience thinking and feeling? Let's think. How did Macbeth start off, Alan? What was he like? Who uh, was he? was a brave warrior who fought for a King Duncan. Exactly. He was killing people all the time, wasn't he? That's he was a hero. Okay. But he's just done this now, and he's shocked by the death. He's shocked at himself. And there's a foreshadowing here of this theme of sleep, isn't there? And why the reason that this, this is really interesting, this particular conversation between the two of them, it's a pivotal moment in their initial relationship, okay? Because he is the one who's done this deed, but he feels terrible. And he thinks that he's murdered somebody's sleep, okay? Peaceful sleep. And now he will never sleep again, all right? She. So, I would suggest um, this, or um, perhaps the, perhaps Shakespeare is shocking the audience by forcing us to watch. The brave, the former brave Macbeth quiver and worry that he will sleep no more. Yeah. Now, Bearing in mind, that would have been very shocking for an audience in those days that, that this person had murdered a king, for one. Okay, that's shocking. But also, that he's quivering now, that this brave soldier is now going, oh, God, sleep. And then what happens? So we could go on now to Lady Macbeth. What the, how does she react to her husband? Uh, she starts taking control. Yeah. She, so we could... That's really good. Yeah, so... <clears throat> the controlling um, reaction of Lady Macbeth... Yeah, by her... Um, direct questioning, questioning, and 
and then you could do the quote. What do you mean? Okay. And then she's followed on. I would even go follow right on there because he starts to repeat sleep again. But I would follow on there by that and then go right on to where she says, get, I'll do it. What? You're going to be scared. You need to get back there. Do that. Smear them. She's quite just you know, disturbing. That, and when you think then, we have this woman, this female, and think of those, so we have that masculine feminine theme, don't we, in Macbeth as well, that's going on. So it's highlighted here, the juxtaposition of roles. He's upset, he's looking for her to comfort him, he doesn't know what he's done, and she's saying, get back out there. This is, what do you think you're doing? This is not on. I'll do it. Okay, now, when we go on now, so we've talked about this, now it's time, isn't it, to look at the rest of the play. Where could you compare this to, Alan? What moment in the play could we compare this to directly? We're thinking about sleep. She talks about blood. Would it be where she's sleepwalking? Yes! Talking about how she can't... Wash yes. the blood off her hands. Perfect. Yes. Exactly. Because what's happened there? Uh, she can't, well, yeah, she can't sleep because of the guilt. She about can't killing the king. Guilt. Yeah. And what, ha what, exactly, and what happens to, so she can't sleep on what's she talking about in terms of blood so she's saying to him go and smear that blood and what she's what's he saying to do with blood what she, so here she's saying um <clears throat> why did you bring the daggers from the place they must lie there go carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood now what does she say about blood in terms of her own She says, out damn spot, out I say. Yeah. So what's she talking about there? What she's, what's happened to her? She's gone and smeared the blood on the grooms and she can't forget about it. Yes. So she, this is an ex And so what's happened to their relationship then at that moment in the play? Uh, they've become distant to each other. Oh, that's a very nice way to put it. <laughs> yeah, well, then there's another moment in the play. Can you think about the moment in the play later on? Just, well, straight after she she dies and there's a cry and Macbeth is standing there, isn't he, saying, put the banners out. And she cries and she's dead. And what 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 is happening to him? What does he think? He said her life was something about a candle like beef yeah. candle yeah and he he has no room for those feelings anymore they're gone he, if he were different he could have once and he's reflecting on this moment okay so there's a reflection of once i did feel those things but they got I, I can't now so if this is the irony the irony here is you know, that we can see that at this moment in the play, she's full of strength and she's saying to him, you stick to it now. We're in this. And he is on, he's, he's doubtful. He's filled with worry and despair and what have I done? And she isn't. But then actually, even despite the fact that she's being asked on sex me, take away any of these feelings, it doesn't happen. But it does to him. Okay, so these are the part, these are the moments in the play. So my way of doing it would be I, I speak to my students and say you use this, this, and then you talk, you add on a moment that attaches to these parts to be led by this conversation and then find another moment. And they're not trying to trick you. They're not trying to trick you. They are helping you. They are guiding you. They're giving you moments in the play that you can find other moments for, you know, so they're not trying to trick you at all. 
but you do have to include the features that you use. You do need to make sure that you're talking about the audience all the time rather than the reader, rather than you. And keep making sure that you're talking about the purpose and analysing and evaluating and exploring the purpose of Shakespeare and whether he's hitting the spots, whether he's doing that. And think about how shocking it is rightly or wrongly to see a woman behaving that way and how especially if we think about it in the context of when Shakespeare was writing okay bear in mind it wouldn't have been a woman on the stage it would have been a man dressed up as a woman <laughs> but women were not supposed to be like this women you know were supposed to be quiet and demure you know having babies so she's almost animalistic she seems possessed at this moment and she wants to be like the witches doesn't she and she talks about the baby being plucked from her and thrown and smashed um so that's the moment that we're at in the play now and then so that was disconcerting that was shocking to an audience that's shocking to see this relationship where she's wearing the trousers and she's in charge. Shocking. So all of that needs to be in it as well at this moment. Um, any questions about that? Not really, no. So is that how they explain, is that how you would do it in your, um, is that what you, it has been suggested to, to do it like in your um, exam, Alan? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah? Okay, we'll have a little quick look at Romeo and Juliet. And as I've said, Alan, it's the same um, techniques. Okay. Um, we didn't remember do it this week or next week because we have four minutes left. Oh, we've only got four minutes left. We'll, we'll yeah. just have a quick look. We know we finished with um, Macbeth. We'll have a quick look. And what I'll do then is if you, I'll send you both those questions. And if you could have a little go of them. I'll just show you quickly this question, okay? Mm -hmm. um, if you could have a little go at them, even if you just do a couple of PEs, I'll mark them for you and give you feedback, okay? Yeah, no problem. Right. I know, we all love homework, don't we? <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, you didn't sound very enthusiastic there, Alex. Okay, so it's this part... Once again, 30 marks. How long should we take on it, by the way, if it's 30 marks? I mean, it's in the in, in English exam, it's like 35 minutes, probably. It's an English exam. But it's, it's, some parts take longer than... Like, normally, you spend, like, spend short time on others, isn't it? So Yeah, yeah, time. exactly. Okay, so it's the Juliet and the nurse, and you will start with this conversation again. And how far did Shakespeare present Juliet as a female character with strong emotion? So we've got both of those female things going on. And remember, we're talking about it in context of the trope, the female trope. How is a woman supposed to act? How is What are the ideas of her? And when we think of Juliet, it's well, we have to think of the innocence and the, the childishness of her. Okay? Yeah. Um, so you think about Juliet in this extract and then Juliet as a female character. Okay, so that's what I would like you to do. I'll put, I don't know if there is a chat channel. What I'll do is I'll send it to Jenny and then she can send it to both of you. So you're doing the Romeo and Juliet one, Alex. And if you could do the um, Macbeth one, please, Alan. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Any questions? Thank you. Okay then, speak to you oh, soon. Oh. next yeah, week. Bye. Bye. Uh, thank you. I'll see you on, it's Tuesday, isn't it, Alan? I'm really looking forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Yeah. Okay, is it, okay, we, we can talk about it on Tuesday anyway. All right, thank you. All right, nice to meet you. Bye, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Um, thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you.